G'day guys, Cam Wild, Wild Touring. We've bought a new car, we're so excited. It's taken ages to decide what we want. Um, we've been back flipping like crazy for months. We probably narrowed it down to two cars. And then uh, they were both great cars, so it was really hard to, to make a decision, but we finally made one. We're sure of what we want for our situation and we've put an order down and we're expecting delivery later this year. So I'm gonna tell you what we've ordered. <clears throat> There's no secrets or anything like that. But before I do that, I do wanna have a, a chat to you about how we arrived at this decision. And this stuff's really personal for us. It's not gonna to apply to everyone, but maybe there's something that you can pull out of this that, that, that would help you if you're in the same sort of situation choosing a car. So firstly, I'll chat, I'll, I'll chat about why we bought a new car. Um, as you know, we've been really happy with the D-Max. We love the D-Max. Um, it's, how old is it? It's a 2016, so it's seven years old now. Um, and we've had a really good seven years out of it. It's done heaps of trips. It's seen a lot of Australia um, and it's, it's never let us down. We've had little issues, but um, certainly nothing that, um, no showstoppers or anything like that. It's been a great car. But our needs have changed. When we bought the D-Max, uh, we didn't have any kids. At that time, if someone had said to us, hey, future-proof, buy something that can tow a big full-size off-road family caravan with, with bunk beds, we'd have laughed at them because there was no way that we thought we were gonna be caravan snobs one day, but here we are. Uh, and we've got two kids with us and a big dog, and um, we're just struggling to take it all in the D-Max. The D-Max has been great. Um, this build with the canopy and the tinny on top and all that sort of stuff is awesome. I've, I've loved it for uh, solo trips, um, camping with the lads, uh, tinny trips. Camping out of the canopy with a swag is wicked. It's built perfectly for that. Um, I've tried to make it into a kind of vehicle that could do everything, and with that, there's always compromise. Uh, I've got the lightest canopy that I, that I could possibly find, um, and you know, Thunderfab built that and they nailed that bill. But all that weight on the rear axle of having a canopy, a tinny, and then trying to put 300 kilos ball weight um, from a caravan just leaves you with no payload. It's just not, it's not really workable. I think you can do that if you've got like a, a yank tank where uh, you've got a longer wheelbase and, and more of the weight's either over the rear axle or in front of it. But on these mid-sized dual cabs, uh, not just the D-Max, but you know, the BT50s, the Tritons, the Hiluxes, any of that sort of mid-sized dual cab, if you uh, set up like this, you've got a lot of weight on and behind the rear axle, which is not ideal for, uh, for weight distribution or handling. Um, and it doesn't, you've also got, you know, it's bigger than just going over GVM or GCM. You've also got rear axle load ratings, which we've always been compliant because we've got the Petters GVM upgrade, but we're very close. And to be able to live out of a caravan full time for a year plus um, is gonna be extremely difficult to take all the stuff that we want to take um, with this car. So that's a big part of it, it's, it's, it's the weights. And then the other part of it that I kind of touched on is since we've had two kids and we've got a dog, two baby seats with two kids and a dog in, in the back of this car is not very comfortable. Um, and driving the car is quite fatiguing uh, when you're fully loaded up very close to GCM towing the caravan. We're looking for something that's uh, bigger in terms of physical size. We, we want a little bit more room for the kids and the dog and stuff in the back. We want something that's bigger in terms of payload um, or weight carrying capacity, so uh, with a higher GCM. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute because it's not as simple as just looking for something with the biggest GCM. But we're also looking for something with bigger brakes, um, bigger drive line, uh, makes more uh, power and torque from factory without having to push it too hard with tuning and chips and all the rest of it. All of those things to sort of handle loading it up with the extra weight. Now I don't have any real brand bias. There's, when, when I've talked to people on social media or in person at like caravan shows and full drive shows and stuff like that, I know there's a lot of people out there that are diehard Toyota or diehard Nissan or um, you know, diehard whatever fans. We're not like that. Tiff couldn't care less what we drive, <laughs> really. She just wants it to be comfortable and safe. And for me, it's much the same as well. I just want it to be reliable, capable, comfortable, and safe. I don't really care what brand it is. I want to be able to get parts for it wherever I go. I want to be able to go remote and it be reliable. And I want it uh, safe to be within my uh, weight limitations with the family on board and be able to handle well and pull up well and, uh, and for us to be able to survive in the event of an accident. So they're the things that are my priorities. I don't really care what brand it is. On that note, I've had a lot of different brands over the years. Since I've been YouTubing, um, I've only had a couple of cars. So you may not know this about me, but I had a bit of a problem with buying and selling cars as a young lad. 
So luckily this was before the YouTube days because I've done some pretty stupid stuff with cars um, and I'm not condoning that, but here's a look at some of the cars I've owned over the years. I've had a MQ Nissan Patrol. I've had a Suzuki Vitara, which is pretty cool. I've had a couple of GQ Patrols. I had one wagon and one ute, one petrol, one diesel. I've had a couple of petrol Pajeros, the V6s. And I think both of them end up doing heads and both of them I pulled down and replaced in mum and dad's driveway as a young fella. That was not fun, they were parked bloody everywhere. I've had a couple of Land Rover Discoveries, one diesel, one V8 petrol. Uh, I've had a Jeep Cherokee, which had electrical issues, <laughs> surprisingly. I've had a 75 series Land Cruiser Ute, that was an old diesel. I've had a 105 series Land Cruiser Wagon, that was a, a diesel that I put a big turbo on and was horribly unreliable after doing that. That was the 1HZ. They, they were an alright motor if you didn't do too much with them, but when you started modifying them, they hated life. Uh, and I had a Nissan Navara, and I'm sure I've missed a few. I also had a lot of um, sedans and stuff when I was even younger. I was into my um, Falcon sedans. Anyway, I've had a few cars, as you can see, and we've got all the brands there. There's, yeah, the big ones, Nissan, Toyota, uh, Land Rover, Jeep, uh, Suzuki, Mitsubishi. We've had a few. Anyway, what I'll do is I'll show you my spreadsheet where I've na narrowed down, because there's quite a lot of vehicles available today, and I've, I narrowed down what was gonna be suitable for us. Righto, here we go. So up the top there's the vehicles that I've compared. A few things here that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but first, let's talk about payload. So this is how I've roughly worked out what sort of payload we need from a vehicle, and I'm not including um, the ball weight of the caravan that we're towing. Now, all this information is specific for us, because I've, I've made this for me. This is not gonna apply to everyone, uh, and some of the information that I've got um, you got to remember pricing and stuff's going to be different state to state. So this is quotes that I've had for gear. Um, it may be different in your state. But here's roughly how much sort of payload I need. So these are the things that I know I'm going to have on board. My family, and I've left some uh, weight there for future proofing because kids are going to get bigger. Uh, steel bull bar, winch, roof rack, side steps, drawers, 12 volt system, uh, a fridge full of beer, some recovery gear, some tools, some water on board, general luggage, you know, kids' toys, shoes, whatever. Um, a tinny on the roof, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I know that I need a minimum of 830 kilos payload, remembering that I've also got to have a uh, ball weight of the caravan that we're towing, which I'll talk about in a minute. So yeah, I need 830 kilos payload. So like I said, here's the vehicles up the top that we were looking at. Here you'll notice that I'm missing all the bigger Yank tanks, like the Ram 2500, uh, the F250, the Silverado. A couple of reasons for that. Uh, and it same applies to trucks. I'm missing like the uh, Isuzu and Fusos and, and that kind of stuff, the uh, light trucks that a lot of people are towing vans with. They're awesome. Yank tanks and trucks make wicked tow rigs. They're not for me because I want a vehicle that's gonna be a great tow rig. It also needs to be a day-to-day -day commuter for me when I'm not uh, full driving and caravanning and traveling. I still need something I can get to and from work in. I need something that I can drop the kids off to school or daycare in. Uh, and then I also want a vehicle that is uh, capable and reliable for going remote on swag trips when I'm not towing a caravan. So I don't fancy driving a four ton plus super wide vehicle um, down tight tracks uh, and onto soft beaches and stuff by myself because some of you are gonna disagree with me, um, but from my experience, the bigger the vehicle is and the heavier the vehicle is, um, the bigger and heavier vehicle you need to try recover you. And that's just how it is. Um, if I get the D-Max stuck on the beach and someone comes past in any, any other sort of mid-size four-wheel drive, they can probably pull me out. That's my personal thoughts on the matter. And with the Yank tanks, same thing. Awesome tow rigs, but they're really wide. They're really long. So um, your ramp over angle and your width on the tracks and stuff is um, compromised. Uh, and also parts and being able to get servicing and repairs around the country, it just gets a little bit more difficult. Oh, look, the other reason was my price uh, or the price, my budget. So I just can't afford an F-250, a Ram 2500. I can't afford to build a truck either, um, which is uh, one of the primary reasons as well, let's be honest. Anyway, that's why they're excluded. I did put in the Ram 1500 and the F-150 because I know a lot of you guys are looking at them. So uh, I thought I'd put the figures I could find in there. The F-150, there's not much on it yet in Australia. There's not that I could find anyway at the time of um, researching it. There's a rough indication of price, so I've, that's pretty much all I've got there. So my, my budget, I'm, I'm 
pretty stretched at spending a hundred grand on a vehicle. Um, you know, I'm gonna have to build it. I'm gonna have to spend money on it after that. So a hundred grand purchase price is already quite a stretch. So that, and most of these vehicles are over that. Now in a normal market, you could look at secondhand vehicles to try save some money on purchase price. But with COVID and other things that have been happening the last few years, secondhand prices are often more than new anyway, because people are trying to avoid uh, the lengthy wait times. And we'll talk about wait times for some of these cars as well. Righto, so the Ram 1500 of the F-150, <clears throat> purchase price for the Ram, 110,000. There's your curb weight. So curb weight is um, the empty weight of the car with a tank of fuel in it, before you put people or any bolt-ons on. There is the GVM. Um, and if you take the curb weight from the GVM, you'll get your payload. I haven't bothered putting that in here because it's kind of irrelevant for me. I'd be putting, all these vehicles are gonna need GVM upgrades to do what I wanna do to them, what I, what I wanna do with them. So there is the um, revised GVMs. This is the GVM that's, that's uh, available at the moment. That's the cost of the GVM upgrade. I don't know for the Ram 1500, I couldn't find exactly, so I've just written five grand because that seems to be about the minimum of GVM upgrade costs. It could be much more, I don't really know. It doesn't really matter, like I said, because I've already sort of excluded this car for us anyway, but it was just to give you some sort of indication. There's your GCM, your combined mass, so that's car and van um, combined, the max you can sit at. There is your payload that is left with the revised GVM. So once you fit the GVM upgrade, that's how much payload the car is going to have by itself. Now, here's the payload left towing my 3.3 tonne van. I've worked this out with my figures, all right? Now I've put in here roof load rating because I want to put a tinny on one of these vehicles, that's the dream. So I would have to put a canopy on this vehicle to be able to uh, put a tinny on the roof. And you're looking at about 135 grand purchase price of the vehicle plus canopy plus GVM upgrade. So that's out of my price range, but the weights are pretty good with a GVM upgrade. So um, that might be something that you're interested in. The Ram 1500 only comes in petrol in Australia. Um, so that would be a con for me. It might not bother you guys, but I would prefer diesel in most instances. That's just where I'm at personally. Uh, the Ineos Grenadier. Now this interested me at, at first. I think they've got a lot of things right. I think it's a pretty good car. Um, it's gonna be pretty cool. Uh, it's gonna be comfortable and capable off-road. Reliability is probably not gonna be an issue for it because they're using things that are already um, commercially available. Engine and um, driveline uh, have come from other vehicles that haven't had too many dramas. Curb weight, this is where they've probably got it wrong. With all the um, comfort and tech and luxury and stuff in the vehicle, it's come out pretty heavy. GVM of 3550, it leaves you with very little payload. Um, 880 kilos of payload, and there's no GVM upgrades available at the moment. There will be. I'd be silly to say there's never gonna be a GVM upgrade available, but I can't make an informed decision on a purchase now when there aren't the things available for it that I'd need to make it work. So right now, 880 kilos of uh, payload. Now the GCM is pretty good at seven ton, um, but with my van on the back, I'd be left with 550 kilos of payload. Like you saw below, I need 830, so it just falls short there. Now when a GVM upgrade does become available, your GCM is gonna be the limitation. Um, so you'd be able to tow, it's pretty impressive, you could, you could tow my 3.3 ton van and still have over a ton of payload left. So when there are GVM upgrades available for the Ineos, it's gonna make a pretty decent um, tow vehicle in, in terms of weight. Here's the, one of the major issues for me, 125 grand um, plus for the car. Uh, you know, purchase price of 120 plus whatever the GVM upgrade is gonna cost. So I'm just saying maybe five grand, I don't know. But we're looking north of 125 to get into an Ineos. That's out of my price range. Now here, this is pretty much the weights of my car, the D-Max right now, or any other sort of mid-size um, uh, dual cab ute, especially like these tie built ones, the Hilux, D-Max, Navara, BT50. They start around 50 to 60 grand. This is sort of averaged across a couple of these models, but a curb weight of 2,100 kilos, a GVM of 3,100 kilos, take those away from each other, and we know it's got a one ton payload, which is pretty good, but the GCM is the limitation of these vehicles. It's only six ton. So we do a GVM upgrade to get it to 3,500 like I did on my car. But by the time we stick a 3.3 ton van on, we're only left with 600 kilos 
of uh, payload. You need, I mean, I would have to put a canopy on it. To be able to use it for camping and to be able to store um, all the gear that I need and to put a, a tinny on the roof, I'd have to put another aluminium canopy on it. So if we find a really light aluminium canopy, like my one from Thunderfab, around 200 kilos, like that's, I'm being really conservative here. If we put a 200 kilo canopy on it, we're left with 400 kilos of payload if we want to tow 3.3 tonne. We know we need 830, we're well short. And that's the issue I've got now. There's no, that's why there's, when I want to tow the van, I've got to gut the canopy, take everything out of it, and there's no way I'm getting the tinny on the roof. Um, so that's sort of the issue I've got now. Plus, if you look at the price, um, by the time you stick a canopy on it, like my car, the car's going to owe you, you know, the best part of 85 grand. So if you have to put a canopy on them, it's, it's not going to be a cheap build. Mine owes me, I worked out the other day, it's disgusting, but it owes me, you know, just as it's sitting now, 110 to 120 grand um, for a car that only cost 40. So overcapitalizing in a, in a car? Yeah, probably. 79 series, Land Cruiser Ute, dual cab. I love these things. Um, it, they don't make a hell of a lot of sense for a few reasons I'll talk about in a minute for me. Um, but I've just got a soft spot for them. They're cool. They're a big diesel V8. Um, they just look tough. There's so many spare parts and aftermarket parts available for them. It's not funny. You can do anything you want with them. They're pretty cool. Now I did actually order one about a year ago. Um, and I was told that it would probably arrive around now. Um, and no fault of the dealer that I purchased through. One of the dealers uh, uh, down south, Bunbury or Boston, can't remember. But things have blown out. They've gone from uh, one year to, you know, maybe in three years. And that timeline just doesn't suit me anymore. Plus, we all know there's gonna be engine and probably driveline changes. They're probably gonna follow suit with the 300 series and put a hot V in it. Um, so you don't really know what you're gonna get, how much it's gonna cost or when it's gonna arrive. And that is way too much uncertainty for me. So I've still got mine on order. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it if I ever do get offered one. I may have to purchase it if I can afford it because <laughs> they are cool. Especially if I get offered like the last of the V8s or if I get offered a 79 with an automatic gearbox. Both of those options appeal to me. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm gonna do there yet. We'll figure that out later. But <clears throat> for right now, for the next vehicle to replace the D-Max, I, it just doesn't work for me. So they're not too badly priced for what they are. Um, 85 grand, uh, curb weight of 2,175 kilos, a GVM of 3,300. You can get some decent GVM upgrades for them. 39.50 and GCM of 6,800 kilos. So your payload, um, just the car alone with the GVM upgrade, 1,775 kilos, that is heaps. But stick a 3.3 ton van on the back like mine with 330 kilos of, of tow ball mass thereabouts and a canopy, because I'm gonna need a canopy on the back to um, camp out of and to put a tinny up top and all the rest of it. And we're reduced to 1,125 kilos of um, payload left. So still a lot, that's still heaps. Like I said, I need about 830. So 1130 is heaps. This lawnmower is getting louder and louder every time you want to film something. And that's going to come in around 110,000, which is not too bad. It's close to my 100 grand sort of limit for the car. But as you, we all know, the 79 series, they're not the most comfortable car. They're not the most powerful car. They're capable of it all, but they need quite a bit of money spent on them. They're pretty basic. They're a leaf sprung, pretty lazy V8. Uh, they only come in manual. Um, yeah, they need quite a bit doing to them to make them a really comfortable, capable full drive or, or touring vehicle or towing vehicle. That's my opinion anyway. A lot of you will agree with me. Some of you may not. But the build price for a 79, by the time I put a canopy on it and I fit it out uh, and uh, wheels and track correction and chipping and tuning and supporting mods to do that, clutch kits, all the rest of it, it's gonna be a fairly expensive vehicle. I feel like they need quite a bit of modifying. Uh, so yeah. Now the next gen Ranger, uh, I'd be looking at the XLT, the, the cheapest of the V6s. I think that's probably where the, the smart money is. These really interested me because they've got, they're sort of leveled up on the, on the other mid-size dual cab utes by offering quite a lot more GCM. So my vehicle and other mid-size dual cabs have got about six ton combined mass. The uh, next gen Ranger has got 6,400 kilos. So 400 kilos more. Now that's what really interested me. Plus the new V6 has got pretty good power figures and all the rest of it. It's quite a lot more expensive than the other mid-size utes. Um, 
but the weights interested me. Until you look a little bit closer, uh, and they're still decent, but not by a long shot. And that's because they start fairly heavy at 2, 3, 30, whereas uh, mine and, and the other mid-size dual cabs are around 2,100. So it's starting around 200 kilos heavier. So you can get GVM upgrades to 3,500, and they're not too expensive. Uh, and that would, the vehicle alone with the GVM upgrade gives you about 1,170 kilos of usable payload versus 1,400 kilos in my vehicle or other mid-size dual cabs. And that's because, like I said, the next gen starts fairly heavy, so it's eating into your payload. Um, stick my caravan on the back, we're left with 770, so we're already falling short of the payload that I need, and this is where I've uh, excluded it. Bang a canopy on top, and you're gonna be pretty limited. But where the next gen differs a little bit to the others, the rest of these vehicles are gonna be limited by your gross combined mass. The next gen, uh, with a 3,500 kilo GVM upgrade, is actually gonna be limited by the, um, by the GVM. So even if they do a larger GVM, bigger than 3,500, which they will, I think Lovells is already working on I want to say four ton or close to. Even with that bigger GVM upgrade, then you're going to be limited by your GCM. Uh, and that would take your, your payload towing a 3.3 ton van to 839, which sort of just scrapes in on my bare minimum if I put a really big GVM upgrade on it. But by the time you add a 200 kilo canopy, I'd be back down to 630 odd kilos of, um, of uh, payload anyway. So it's the weight's just not going to work for me. And then, the price to do all of that, uh, to buy the, the vehicle 75, to stick a 20 grand canopy on it, to stick a five grand GVM upgrade on it, it's gonna owe me $100,000 by the time I'm done anyway. And when I say stick a canopy on it, I mean an empty canopy, like the same as an empty wagon. This is before you put drawers or anything like that. There's no point talking about that because whether I buy a wagon or I put a vehicle, an empty canopy on a vehicle, the cost of fitting them out is relative. So um, yeah, we're looking at 100 grand before we fit out. Now 200 series Land Cruisers, I've got mates with 200s and they are beautiful cars and I love them and they're king of the road. They are, you know, they've got that reputation for good reason because they tow really well. They're capable off-road, they're reliable, they've really proven themselves over the last sort of decade they've been available. Now you can't buy them, you obviously can't buy them new anymore so I'm, we're, I'm looking, this is probably the only vehicle that I would have considered um, second-hand. Uh, so the price is 90 to 120,000 for a neat low kilometer unmolested model looking at 90 to 120 grand their, their purchase price second hand has shot up above what the purchase price was new because they're in demand and that's just the market we're in at the moment and i'm you know what i'm not prepared to pay more for a second hand vehicle than i would for a new that just shits me um i just can't do it uh, yeah if you if people that have done it i totally understand why but I don't know, that just grinds me. Anyway, curb weight. They're fairly heavy to start with again. Uh, they are a big car. 2,740 kilos, they take fuel on board. GVM of 3,350. So they have very limited payload without a GVM upgrade. So anyone who's towing, who's got a kitted out 200 series and they're towing a heavy full-size family off-road van without a GVM upgrade, you are almost definitely overweight. You can get GVM upgrades for them. You can get a 3,800. Uh, up to like a 4200, there may be others. These are just ones that I've quickly been able to find. And depending on what size GVM upgrade you get, you're looking at like, you know, seven to 15 grand. Combined mass of 6850, which is pretty good. Payload with the GVM upgrade, depending on which one you got, you're looking at 1,000 kilos or 1,460 kilos. Um, stick my caravan on the back, which is only 3.3 ton. Remember people are towing three and a half ton with these things everywhere. Uh, I'd be left with 730 or 810, depending on which GVM upgrade you fit again. And remembering that I need around 830, we're just pretty bloody tight on payload there. Um, and we're limited by the GCM. Now they've got a really good roof load rating, 200 kilos. And that's why people love 200 series Land Cruisers. But like I said, the payload's really limited. Um, so you couldn't, I need 830 kilos just to put a 100 kilo tinny on top. And these have got 730 to 810 kilos of payload left towing 3.3 ton. So I don't know how people are putting, you, you couldn't use this roof load rating anyway. You just cannot have a 200 series Land Cruiser kitted out with all these sort of basic touring mods, towing a 3.3 ton van, so we're not even at the full tow capacity of the vehicle, 
with a GVM upgrade, you know, spending up to 14 grand on a 4,200 kilo GVM upgrade, you can still only use about 100 kilos of that roof load rating before you're overweight. So it was, it's potentially doable for me, but it's gonna cost me, by the time I put a GVM upgrade on it, and pay the uh, pretty obnoxious second-hand prices of these vehicles at the moment, it's gonna cost me 97 to 134,000. That's just a rough guesstimate, all right? Um, prices probably vary state to state. There may be other cheaper GVM upgrades available with slightly different weights, but this gives you an idea. It, it's, it's close on weight. I could probably um, sort of stretch and do it, but for the price, I'm not going to. So these are the two vehicles that I got stuck on. The Y62 Patrol, looking at the bottom spec, the TI, or the GX300 Land Cruiser, which is also the bottom spec. Now, a couple of things. I, I, I was really pretty dead set keen on the Y62 after driving my mate Kim's, and a few of my mates have got them now and done wicked builds on them, and they're having no dramas with, um, with weight, towing full-size off-road vans and stuff. Um, I was pretty keen on getting one. Probably the major thing that was holding me back was being concerned about having a massive, naturally aspirated petrol V8. Fuel economy is gonna be an issue. Plus they wanna run on 98 octane, which is not available everywhere. Yep, people are running them on 91, 95, but they're supposed to run on 98. So uh, in terms of like, if I had an issue, uh, warranty, insurance, I don't really know. I'd like to uh, meet or exceed the requirements that manufacturers ask you in terms of like, uh, what sort of fuel and a wheel and you put in the vehicle and what sort of uh, maintenance schedule you're following, I'll generally meet or exceed those requirements. So I'm not super comfortable uh, buying it and then running it brand new and then running it on 91 octane if you're supposed to run it on 98. And again, people are going to disagree with me there, but I just wouldn't be able to do it. I can't spend 100 grand on a vehicle or 92,000 on a vehicle and then run it on the fuel it's not supposed to run. Now, 98 octane in Perth is pretty much 20 cents a litre more expensive than diesel every day of the week. It doesn't change too much. Let's have a look at the rest of the figures though. Uh, curb weight, 2861, so it's fairly heavy. GVM, factory GVM is 3,500. I'd probably be looking at a GVM upgrade of 4,200 kilos. You can get bigger, but the GCM becomes your limitation. Let's talk about GCM upgrades after this, because I know that's what people are thinking. GVM upgrade price is around 10 grand, so they're fairly expensive to do GVM upgrades, and that's because they've got that uh, HBMC suspension. It's a little bit more uh, to it than your simple double wishbone front uh, falling rear like you have on your 200 or your 300 series Land Cruiser. So fairly expensive to put GVM upgrades on it. Huge GCM of seven ton. Payload with a GVM upgrade, uh, 1330 kilos. Payload left towing, a uh, 3.3 tonne van is 839. GCM is the limitation here. Uh, roof load rating of 100 kilos. And by the time I buy one for 92,000, that's WA prices, and stick a 10 grand GVM upgrade on it, I'm looking at about $102,000 for the Y62. So to be honest with you, I was pretty sold on the Y62. Um, I'd even managed to talk Tiff into it, and we were really close to buying one, like that close to pulling the trigger on one. Um, I hadn't given too much thought to the 300 series for a long time because I was listening to too much noise about them. People were continually saying to me, why would you spend you know, 30 grand more on a 300 series uh, over a Y62? 30 grand gets you a lot of petrol, even if petrol's more expensive. And you're right, 30 grand does get you a lot more petrol. But there's not 30 grand in it between them. So I think with the Y62, they come with leather seats and carpet floors and a pretty flash dash. They're pretty nice inside. And I think people are comparing the bottom spec, you know, the TI Y62 with, you know, like a Sahara or a VX 300 series, which are going for, you know, like 130 grand, because that's probably the model with the, you know, the carpet floors and the leather seats and stuff. Um, that stuff doesn't really worry me too much. I, I, if I was buying a 300 series, or well, I am buying a 300 series. <laughs> Cat's out the bag there. But I'll be buying the bottom spec 300, the GX. So, yep, it comes with cloth seats and vinyl floors. Vinyl floors is better for what I do anyway. Cloth seats, leather seats, I don't care. I'm putting seat covers on both of them. Up in the Kimberley on 40 plus degree days with black leather seats is not gonna fly. You're gonna be putting seat covers on them. So that doesn't really bother me. Uh, otherwise, between bottom specs of both, other than the seats and the floor, I think they were kind of on par in terms of um, uh, comfort and uh, how nice they are inside. 
I mean, if anything, I think the 300 was probably a little bit nicer. The Y62 is really nice, but it's 10 years old and it does look dated inside, especially with the wood grain and stuff. Yep, you can change that, that's true. But the GX had a, has got a, a nicer, uh, it's got a nine inch touchscreen display. It's got climate control, dual climate control, um, Apple CarPlay, all that kind of stuff. It's got more sensors than I know what to do with. It's pretty modern, it's pretty flash, it's pretty nice. So like, honestly, I think they were pretty much on par in terms of comfort and tech and stuff uh, from my perspective. There was also a lot of people that were saying that they'd driven the 300 series Land Cruiser and either come from a Y62 or from a 200 and they felt that the 300 felt really small. Um, yeah, I'll give you that. S sitting in the driving position, the tra transmission tunnel and stuff's quite high. You're kind of sort of boxed in a little bit like you're in a bit of a cockpit but it's definitely comfortable. There's definitely enough room for, for me. I'm six foot three for my knees and my legs and stuff. And I drive with a seat, you know, I, I'm straight arming it when I drive normally. So the seat's right back. And Tip was still able to sit behind me. Um, and she's not short for a, for a woman either. So for our kids for the next 10 years, that car is definitely gonna be big enough. For me, six foot three, that car is big enough. Um, it's very comfortable. Uh, the armrest is about twice as wide as what we've got in the D-Max. We did not feel that the 300 series was small in any way, but maybe that's because we're coming from the, um, from the D-Max. The overall uh, length and width of the car, it's slightly bigger than the 200 series, interestingly, and I think slightly smaller than the Y62, if memory serves me. But on the road, um, I did find the Y62 felt very big on the road. Like I was watching in my mirrors to see where the um, white line was on the edge of the road so I could stay central the 300 series felt a little bit smaller on the road. Um, but yeah, much of a muchness really. They were both heaps bigger than we're used to and both very comfortable and felt spacious inside. And then let's talk about price between the two. So um, the GX, I was getting quotes for 99, $100,000, right? So there's only eight grand in it between them. Lead time, a lot of people were telling me that there's 18 month plus lead times for Land Cruisers. Depends what model you're getting, I suppose, and what dealer you're getting it from. I've ordered mine from Newtown Toyota uh, in Perth, and my expected lead time's like six months for a GX. Now the GX does come on steel rims, 17 inch uh, steel rims. Doesn't bother me, because I'm gonna put load rated uh, aluminum rims to suit the GVI upgrade and stuff that I'm fitting anyway. I'm gonna put bigger tires on it. I'd do the same thing with the Y62 anyway, so I don't really care about the rims. The GX300 comes with a raised air intake. I'm not gonna call it a snorkel because I don't, I, I, the factory uh, Land Cruiser snorkels are never sealed properly. They're generally a couple of pieces and I think this is no exception. I think it's a two or three piece design and I'll either be replacing that with a proper snorkel or I'll have to find some sort of way to seal it. I don't know yet. But it starts a lot lighter. The 300 is 2495 curb weight. So you're 350, 360 kilos lighter to begin with. The GVM 3280, um, by the time you put a GVM upgrade on it, uh, Petters do a 4090 uh, GVM upgrade, or they're going to be doing that anyway. Uh, price, look, I'm not certain on that yet because I haven't got a final price on it, but it's gonna be a lot less anyway than the Y62. And that's because the suspension's a lot simpler in many ways. The 300 series has adopted the same uh, suspension as the 200, so it's got the double wishbone front and the four link rear, um, solid axle. So it's gonna be substantially cheaper to modify. Uh, it's just a simpler design. And that's gonna even up the price in the end between the two. GCM seven, uh, 6750, quite a lot lower than the Y62, but remember it's starting 360 kilos lighter. So once you fit your GVM upgrade, you've got uh, nearly 1600 kilos for the 300 versus 1340 for the Y62. Hitch my 3.3 ton van on the back and we've got 950 kilos of payload left. And that for me was one of the major standouts for the 300 when I've crunched all the numbers. It's got a lot of payload left towing my van, um, a lot more than the other ones that we've been looking at. Uh, the 79's got a lot more, but I can't get one, so we're excluding that. Roof load rating for the 300, 92 kilos. That's like the lowest of the bunch. But that figure, we, I'm gonna do a video on that later once I get some firm information, but I suspect that that's not as it seems. It may be a bit higher than that, but I'll do a video on that because that's an interesting topic in itself. So 300 series cruiser, by the time I put a GVM upgrade on it, I'm looking at 105,000 versus 102 for the Y62. These are the two models that I was deliberating on. I think I would have been really happy with either of them. 
I think the Y62 is a big naturally aspirated V8. They're a big car, they're comfortable, they're powerful. Um, they're probably the last of the big petrol V8s that we're going to get in Australia. I think um, the next decade we're probably going to be driving hybrids or EVs anyway. So it had that cool factor. They're proven. Um, there's a lot of aftermarket parts available for them. Um, they're a pretty tough off-road vehicle. People putting 37s on them and wheeling them pretty hard. They're supercharging them. There's lots of cool things you can do with them. And that's it, they're a cool car. Um, so I understand like the cult following. Um, I get it. I reckon they're really cool too. I think if I was looking for a car to go um, camping and full driving in, sort of like I have with the D-Max, more sort of solo, lads trips, swag camping, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, hitting the dunes, hitting the full drive tracks, I'd probably look, I'd probably lean towards the Y62. I think the next couple of years for me looks like a lot of remote long distance touring with the caravan and the family on board. And I think the 300 series cruiser is probably a better choice for that. It's more economic, it makes more torque, it's got more gearing, um, and it's got more payload. So it sort of suits that uh, sort of caravanning lifestyle um, for us a little bit better. But yeah, let me reiterate, I think I would have been happy with either. I, uh, they're, they're similar price, similar lead time, um, similar sort of comfort. They both drive beautifully. Um, the weights are, you know, there's 120 kilos between them for me, um, towing the van. So yeah, I think I, could, I would have been happy either way. I've just slightly leaned towards the 300 and um, Tiff and I have ummed and ahed about it for ages and that's just the way that we decided we want to go. Now I'm going to talk quickly about GCM upgrades because there's probably people watching from all around the country and rules are different state to state, but federally the Department of Transport um, allows the states to govern GCM upgrades. And in Western Australia at the moment, right now, this may change in the future, but right now in Western Australia, um, the WA Department of Transport do not assess, endorse or approve GCM upgrades, regardless of them being a pre-rego SSM dot don't want to know about it. So it's not an option for me. In, in the future, things may change. I kind of hope so. I hope federally we're all on the same page and the rules are black and white because that's what we need, especially when you're dealing with insurance companies. You, if there's any gray area, it's going to bite you in the butt. Anyway, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, my mouth's dry and I've run out of coffee, so that'll do. Um, we're really excited to take delivery of our new 300 series Land Cruiser at the end of this year, and there'll be a build series to follow that. Pretty big plans, um, what we want to do to it. Nothing too crazy, um, but we don't want to mess around. We want to get it done, and then we want to start using it and enjoying it. And this is going to be the vehicle that, that takes us around Australia on our big trip, which is getting closer and closer. So yeah, anyway, um, thank you for all those people that have messaged and commented and emailed with um, their thoughts and suggestions and stuff on, on getting a new vehicle. And uh, hopefully you can get something out of uh, this video, you guys that are in the same position looking at, at buying a new tow rig or touring rig or whatever it is that you're into. Hopefully there was something in this um, for you. Anyway, cheers guys, I'll see you in the next one.